LegalizeFreedom.com Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Beyond politics, poverty and war. LegalizeFreedom.com Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host Greg Moffat and my guest today is Jim Elvidge, who joins us to discuss his book, The Universe Solved, a new provocative view of the true nature of reality. Have you ever felt that there is something strange about the world we live in? Something about reality that isn't quite random, as it should be. Something a little too organized, a little too planned, a little too programmed. What if reality isn't really what you think it is? What if our world is just like one big video game? According to Elvidge, it's actually not as far-fetched as it seems. Within 30 years, he maintains that we will be able to create virtual environments indistinguishable from our current reality. Within a few more decades, even physical realities will be manufactured. He also believes that we are marching toward an inevitable merge with machines and artificial intelligence. What's more, we may even have already reached that point, and it's simply impossible to tell. An expert in complex computational systems with over 20 years of research in cosmology, quantum mechanics, philosophy and futurism, Elvidge presents a theory of reality so perfect and so powerful that it explains all known scientific and cultural anomalies. Why is the universe so perfectly designed to support life and matter? Why does life feel like it is accelerating? Why do people see UFOs? Is there life after death? The evidence is actually all around us, within us, and present in every decision we make. Hello and welcome, Jim, and thank you so much for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. Oh, thank you very much, Greg. I am really uh, happy to be on the show and uh, looking forward to our conversation. Okay, Jim. Now, today we're going to be discussing some of the ideas in a book that you published quite a few years ago. It's entitled The Universe Solved, A New Provocative View of the True Nature of Reality. Uh, now, that's a pretty big claim you're making there in the title. But before we dive into all that, just for listeners who don't know, uh, just tell us a little bit about your background and your career in general. Oh, sure. Yeah. And I admit that that uh, title is in, intentionally a little bit provocative and out there. It, honestly, it helps sell books a little bit. But, you know, deep down, uh, the, the foundations of this uh, philosophy that, w- that we'll be talking about today um, do provide, if not a solution to everything, they provide a, a you know reasonable explanation for everything. So, yeah, my background uh, was engineering. Um, I went to uh, engineering school and, you know, started off as a software developer, um, and, you know, then kind of went up the management ranks uh, with a number of companies. Right now, um, I'm employed generally as a uh, as an agile coach, which is a software um, and basically a, a organizational methodology. And, um, you know, but on the side, I've always had a fascination with uh, physics, with what makes the world tick. Uh, even while I was in school, I took, uh, I probably could have minored in physics. I took an awful lot of physics classes, quantum mechanics and so it's always been a, you know, an undercurrent of my life to keep up with those things. And I'd say, uh, oh, some time ago, maybe 15 years ago, even, you know, kind of got more interested in, you know, alternative views of the world, th- things about the world that didn't make sense according to your fundamental materialistic uh, theories of, uh, of physics. Um, paranormal occurrences, you know, were they real? And, you know, looking into all that and trying to make some sense of it all and it kind of hit a 
upon some ideas that tied it all together nicely. And I did write that book back in um, 2007, 2008 uh, called The Universe Solved. And I have another one coming out soon, which uh, kind of takes it to the next level. Okay, so you've hinted there basically the overarching idea of the book. Uh, Perhaps we could just uh, put a little bit more flesh on those bones for people. I mean, phrases like artificial intelligence and the idea of avatars, uh, the idea that um, we might be living in some kind of like artificially created simulation. Uh, the, these are ideas that have been around for a while. And certainly in the popular consciousness, I think the 1999 movie, The Matrix, did a lot to put these ideas out there, shall we say. And you're not necessarily advocating that uh, we might be existing in some kind of situation like that. That's just one view of it. But um, from your own particular perspective, Let's just say a little, give a little bit more detail of this, this concept, this idea. Oh, sure. And words are, are powerful. So when people say things like, um, even a word like simulation kind of implies that there's some intent behind it, that there's a programmer of a simulation. And um, it's not necessarily the case. You know, words like artificial, um, imply somehow that it's not real. Uh, and, and so, it's really very difficult to talk about a lot of these concepts um, when when the words have powerful meanings to to people. So, um, you know, I'll just say that in general, I've been collecting categories of evidence that the world is programmatic in some sense. I mean, basically that it's digital and that our consciousness is kind of wrapped up in that. And whether there's a force behind it isn't clear. However, it does seem that the evidence is pointing more toward the idea that all that there is or the, uh, you know, kind of the, the system that we're part of is self-evolving, that it isn't a, you know, hacker alien somewhere that uh, created a simulation that we're all living in like the Matrix or, or the AI run amok kind of uh, scenario that, that, no, it's, you know, it's more like a um, an evolutionary system. So that and, and that's really come about, I think, more in the last 10 years or so, you know, that kind of thinking um, than the idea that we're, you know, living in a virtual reality that's created by some uh, intelligent entity. When you mention about the idea of, of reality being fundamentally digital in nature, reality I'm not sure about, but digital is something else. Yeah, I mean, there were, uh, like, Ed Fredkin uh, was, uh, actually, I think it goes back to Conrad Zeus, um, a German... Uh, scientist uh, wrote a book or a paper called Calculating Spaces, I believe, and that was maybe one of the first uh, treatments of, um, you know, of reality as possibly being digital. But, you know, it, it goes back much further than that. You know, the, uh, you know, Greeks talked about atomic, you know, fundamental uh, units of existence. So, you know, the, the word atom comes from a, a Greek word. So if you think about the idea that there are some fundamental building blocks, well, that's a discrete, um, you know, philosophy in and of itself. Um, Over the years, physicists have kind of broken apart the atom and said, well, no, it's a lot more complex than that. You know, there are are these things called fields and they're continuous and uh, these subatomic particles behave, you know, differently and and things like that. So, um, you know, the, the, the idea of the world being discrete or digital is not new at all. Um, but it's definitely new in our mindset, uh, certainly in our Western mindset, uh, you know, the idea of, you know, you know, that the world fundamentally is digital is not really embraced by that many scientists. Although I'd say it is more and more. I mean, there's a, you know, very, um, uh, astute uh, scientist guy named Max Tegmark, uh, who made a comment that nothing's ever been measured to uh, more than like uh, 16 digits of resolution. So it's impossible for anybody to say, oh, look, you know, here at this fundamental level, it's digital or it's continuous. Um, You know, our measurement systems have had an inability to go much deeper. So we can't really tell for sure. But there are hints. And a lot of what my book is about is collecting all of those hints that the world is digital and saying, well, there's nothing else that explains all of those hints you know maybe we should just kind of face the evidence and acknowledge that it probably is digital it makes a it makes a lot of sense and it explains a lot of things yeah well you were mentioning you know this idea about what accounts for what we actually see what we experience 
And if we have a, you know, a theory that accounts for most things or even perhaps all things, then that should be considered perhaps most likely, but it's not often how we really go about trying to understand reality. Now, as you say, what you're trying to do is say, look at some anomalies, for example, they're a good place to look. And if you can find something that mops these up that accounts for them, maybe we should be looking in that direction. I mean, I know you're aware of the work of Tom Campbell, and that was his, the, my big theory of everything, my big tool guy. And that was his starting point, which is like, well, what, what are we actually experiencing here? What do we see? And how could we perhaps explain that rather than just saying, oh, hey, we have a theory here of reality, but across here on one side we've had to set all these things aside that we can't explain yeah exactly and, and i know tom and uh, tom and i have uh, shared some uh some emails over the years and done done a show together um and i, I like his book a lot he he uh, thought through a lot of uh, good ideas and you're right these are ground up concepts these aren't theories looking for uh for evidence the, you know the evidence came first we're trying to find a best fit theory to the evidence and there's you know different kinds of ways that people can uh can reason there's deductive reasoning and inductive and abductive and i think it's the latter that is more of a best fit idea where you say here's a a, a set of anomalies or a set of things that are unexplained what are the theories of ev evidence or the theories of everything that could explain you know, some of those anomalies. And this is actually something that I spent a lot of time on in my new book that's um, in production right now, is the, the idea of like a Venn diagram. You're probably familiar with Venn diagrams from school where you have, a, you know, a circle of all things that are red, and then there's a circle of all vehicles, and red fire engines happen to be the intersection of those two circles. Well, you can apply that Venn diagram concept to theories and to anomalies where you Think of um, anomaly spaces, uh, you know, a bunch of points on a, uh, on, on a paper or, or a wall or something like that and, you know, put a circle around the ones that are explained by various theories, for example, string theory or, um, or, or creationism, you know, as a, as a god. Um, but the only one that explains all the anomalies is the one that Tom and I um, have been, been talking about. So, so it is a, it's a powerful, philosophy and um, it's really based on a lot of sound logic and sound scientific evidence. It's interesting that a lot of um, ideas that have been coming to us uh, from cutting edge physics for example uh, in the last century or so reflect um, ideas or echo ideas that have been around for a lot longer um, you know whether it's um, you know eastern uh, wisdom traditions for example about the nature of reality in the world and how it all came into being when we say we read some pop physics books these days and uh, time, space and matter, as we conventionally think of them, are all being undermined or in, in doubt somehow. This is an old, old idea. And I'm mentioning this in the context of feeling that a bit like uh, Neo in the Matrix, feeling that there was something kind of not wrong with the world, but that we weren't there was something fundamental that we weren't quite grasping. And I don't know about you, when you, how this occurred or when this occurred rather in your, your life, it was something that you've always had or whether it's something that you developed the sense of conventional explanations for life, the universe and everything just not being satisfactory. I certainly had it from the, er one of my earliest memories is just thinking this is not, there's something not right here. We haven't grasped this correctly. We're not seeing this. And maybe we can't. I also thought to myself. So I don't know when in, in your life, you had this sense of like, no, this isn't it. I'm just not happy with what I've come out of school with as, you know, <laughs> explanations for reality. Yeah, I, I, it did happen. It didn't happen early like uh, you said it did with yourself. And, and, you know, it's good for you that you, you had those instincts early on. That's pretty cool. Um, you know, having the kind of education that I had where you're taught at a university, this is how things are. You know, it, you're not taught generally, um, this is how things could be, or this is what we think today. But, you know, if you look at the past 500 years, what we thought 500 years ago is not what we think today. So let's assume that we don't know everything today. That's kind of not the way, uh, you know, you're, you're taught in school. You're, you're taught about things that are black and white. And so it's easy to come out of, uh, you know, a college education that's heavy in science and logic and engineering technology and things like that. It's easy to come out and have a, a very, rigid view of the world. But um, over time, as you talk to individuals who had these experiences that can't be explained, or you, 
you open yourself up to reading about things that are a little outside of your comfort zone, for example. And I did a lot of that because I just enjoy that. Um, then you start questioning the things that you're, you, you know, you're taught. And you, what I've realized is that there's a kind of a compartmentalization that goes on in, in uh, traditional education. It is to talk about the things and to teach about the things that we think we know in this, you know, compartmentalized set of subjects. Um, other set of subjects, we're going to dismiss those as being, um, either irrelevant or anomalies or, or things that can be explained by delusional individuals or whatever those are. And so, you know, you don't really uh, dive into the research in those. I give so much credit to scientists who are willing to look at some of these other things and put a paper out there or come up with a an experiment that shows some objective evidence that the world is not the way we think it is. And there are more and more all the time. There was a, a guy from Cornell University, which is where I went, um, Daryl, I'm going to forget the name now, Daryl Bem, I think, who did a number of studies on precognition. And it was fascinating the way he, he did it. He kind of turned around the protocol um, in uh, typical uh, studies and found that, that people were actually sensing uh, something that hadn't happened yet. And his uh, error bar for this was uh, statistically significant. So in other words, it was, uh, you know, much less than you would, than an error bar for this kind of experiment would normally be. So his results were very significant. Um, and he's not claiming he knows what's causes, causing all of that, but he's just putting out there that, you know, here's something anomalous about our reality that, um, there's now scientific evidence for, and good for him. You know, he, he had the courage to do that in the face of, uh, uh you know, the onslaught of uh, criticism that, that you're going to get from something like that. Yeah, a lot of um, the the attitudes towards um, you know scientific attitudes towards you know nature of reality are very much grounded. It seems to me in a need that we seem to have as a species to kind of have answers and to understand our position. You know, understand the world and our place in it. You know, we resist the idea that reality could be somehow fluid or that we don't in fact know everything. We I mean, certainly since the scientific Re uh, revolution there there was a a gathering sort of feeling that well we don't quite know everything but we're nearly there you know the, the information's coming in apace and pretty soon we'll you know there won't be any big questions left to answer anymore and the the, the opposite is actually the reality of the matter but we still have this attitude of like okay yeah you're right that doesn't make sense in the co context of our our thinking but it'll be explained soon or we'll just put it to one side forget about it for the time being and i've never quite understood the um that need to have a to live in a fixed reality where everything's understood. I find it, that idea quite unattractive. That's I like the, <laughs> I like the idea that there's no possible way that we can somehow know everything. And I'm, your attempts, for example, or Tom Campbell's attempts to try and set out an overarching theory that might help us, I still think that you would concede that even if you could successfully do that, that doesn't mean that all the answers are about everything ever are somehow going to be in. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I really like that you brought that up. Um, because the there's a it, it, this is where my uh, day job career kind of overlaps this philosophy um, in business. A lot of people are very uncomfortable with uncertainty. They feel like they need to know all of the details before they can make an estimate for when they'll be able to build something or deliver something. And that's not the way the world works. Where there's the world is a very complex system. It's a complex interactive system and you can't predict what's going to happen. So it's much better to adopt a process, a mindset where you're, uh, you, you know, willing to react to changes rather than trying to fit things into a, a fixed, uh, think system, think system uh, for the German word. Um, much better to be be resilient than than kind of stick to that. And you're right. I think it was in the 80, 1880s or something like that. It was uh, Mickelson, I believe. And I don't want to throw him under the bus, but I think he was the one, the scientist, who said um, that all we we had understood everything, 
and that all we needed was a few more orders of uh, re resolution, and that's what science was about at that point. But, but that was before relativity and before quantum mechanics, which completely revolutionized the way we think about reality, and it was before they uh, split the atom apart. So for sure, the one truism is that we don't know everything and that everything is different than we think it is. Well, I still don't think that the the real implications of a uh, sort of quantum mechanics have been absorbed into mainstream science, never mind mainstream society. I mean, I studied physics during the 1980s, and I've made this point on here before. We did, we, we did nothing about quantum mechanics, quantum theory. Absolutely zilch. Einstein's name was mentioned in some other context, but we did none of it at all. It was all vacuums and magnetism, whatever else it was. <laughs> I don't remember that much now, but the point is that we didn't touch quantum theory at all. And I, looking back, that's quite shocking, really. Yeah, and, and quantum theory is, a, I think, a core part of this philosophy because it is one area of science that is well understood. It's it's predictable in some sense, and it uh, hints at an underlying you know difference in the reality than than what really exists. And what's happened over the years, I think, is there have been a couple of different camps, like many different camps. There, are, if you Google uh, interpretations of quantum mechanics, you'll find a dozen or more different ones, and they're coming up all the time. But there's this certain camp of researchers who really want to stick to the idea that there is an objective reality out there that is fixed, and you know, and and this goes along the lines of what we we're talking about: people being. Um, uncomfortable with uncertainty that they they feel there has to be and einstein was kind of in that camp you know he said god doesn't play dice uh, i'm probably paraphrasing that but then there's another camp that says well let's take the evidence for what it is and and you know think about what 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 could be causing that and so the observer effect uh, being a big example of this you know has been you know proven that when you interfere with an experiment when we you start to look at where particles go, which direction they go, and things like that, you just the nature of observing it changes the outcome of exper of the experiment. Well, on the face of it, that sounds like our conscious intent, our minds are somehow connected to the physical reality. and that's that's a really cool concept. Um, however, it isn't necessarily that. It could be that that the um, experiment itself is um, running in a way that is extremely efficient, and so it's n it's not efficient to kind of leave the decision of whether a particle went one way or another way hanging for very long. So, as soon as in, in in reality, it is hanging. But as soon as even the experimental apparatus makes some decision about that, regardless of whether there's a human involved. You know, perhaps that collapses this probabilistic wave function and, uh, and, and generates the kind of history of that little bit of our, our reality. It's, it's a, it, it's, that's a fairly new idea now. Um, so it's kind of a branch off of the consciousness based observer effect, uh, branch. It's more like the efficient universe, uh, observer effect. The idea that we've kind of been hinting at time, space, matter are not as they appear to be at most times and that actually there may be something uh, much more fluid about the reality of them. Uh, that is to say that uh, past, present and future may in fact be somehow simultaneous, uh, always accessible and just not in a flow from past through to future as we think of it. And I think that a lot of that uh, we mentioned earlier about anomalous phenomena like psychic phenomena for, phenomena for example all manner of weirdness and strangeness kind of almost depend on that being the case and i was mm -hmm. very intrigued by something that uh, you brought up towards the the beginning of your book actually uh basically the question what do we really know about history because a lot of people considering these matters would say well yes over here we have the big bang and we have the you know, background radiation we have evidence for the development of the universe over this long period of time we have all these steps along the way but you called that into question in a way and I was actually reminded when I was reading that bit of your book, a book that I'd read uh, a few years ago by a 
philosopher, I suppose, a guy called Owen Barfield, who was writing post-Second World War, uh, quite ahead of his time with some of his ideas. But in his book, Saving the Appearances, he posits the idea that it is consciousness that, that kind of that, that, that mediates reality, so to speak. And he suggested that all the events of prehistory, you know, the Big Bang, if it ever happened, and all the development of the universe up to that point, anything that supposedly happened before consciousness was around to observe it didn't actually happen. It was simple. Mm-hmm. It was simply a, simply an accurate description of what could have happened, what might have happened if consciousness had been around to observe it. And I thought, wow, you know, it was just such a mind bending idea. So before there was consciousness, all the stuff that we apparently have evidence for didn't actually happen. And that was brought back to your question: you know, what do we actually really know about history? You know, what, um, you know, what constitutes evidence for historical? Events. I'm not talking about in, in human affairs here, but just in, in you know the development of material reality. Oh yeah, sure. I, I could go in several different directions too. I was just jotting some notes down here. Uh, yeah, yeah. This whole idea. There's a, a concept called last Thursdayism, which is the idea that the universe was created last Thursday, and <laughs> it, it could be any day, of course. But they picked that. I don't know, maybe because it sounds sounds the best, but. Um, you know, theoretically, you could imagine that, okay, here we are, we're all playing some massive video game, and we've just kind of goggled in or gotten our mind probe or whatever set up, and they they just establish this gigantic set of artifacts uh, in our reality, which consists of, you know, all the books that, that you can go find and, you know, things that you can uh, Google on the web and, and all of that stuff, and it was just planted there, and, and now we're, we're moving on from that point. And it's, it's, it's an absurd idea because it, it I mean, it just, it, it's just absurd because we do, we seem to remember our childhood and everything. But you know what? They, they, even today, uh, people who are doing research in, in uh, brain computer interfaces and things are able to inject false memories into your brain, uh, and, and, uh, even erase certain memories. They're doing experiments with mice along these, these lines here. So. So, yeah, our memories could be fallible. The, the the physical artifacts that we have in our reality are, you know, some people will say, oh, well, there's there's this, uh, you know, evidence of something and you turn around and it doesn't actually exist. Um, so it, we, you don't really know how things started. All we're doing with the Big Bang Theory is inferring what happened based on the data that we see today. Uh, and there were a lot of problems with it back, I don't know, some 20 years ago or so, that things just didn't line up in the standard Big Bang Theory. And uh, I forget who it was, uh, Alan Guth maybe, came up with the inflationary theory, which says, oh, well, that's because in the first, you know, second of uh, creation, the Earth space expanded in a hyper, uh, hyper speed, you know, faster than speed of light manner. Wait, what? I thought you couldn't go faster than the speed of light. Um, okay, well, this is an exception. Um, you know, and, and so, so now it's, that's an accepted, uh, uh, theory because, I mean, it's a, it's a well accepted theory because it fits the evidence much better. But there's an awful lot of fudging that kind of had to go on there to, to, to adapt that one. And, and even now with inflationary Big Bang theory, there's still a lot of anomalies that we're going to continue to, uh, break down over time. You know, another one that, that I love is, dark matter. Dark matter seems to be this thing that creates some gravitational field, but that we can't detect it in some way. So from that, people are inferring this mysterious form of matter that doesn't interact with uh, with most of the forces like electromagnetic force, so we can't bounce photons off it to see it. Um, but it's there generating uh, gravity. Well, other people have taken the opposite approach saying, Oh, the problem is that we have uh, an incomplete picture of what gravity is. So the math of gravity has to be changed. Those are two drastically different approaches to solving the same anomaly. Well, you mentioning dark matter there, and of course, dark energy reminds us that there's all sorts of things that are cooked up in order to plug holes in, in theories. There isn't actually necessarily any evidence for, but it's kind of like if this was real, then that would help us, you know, with uh, mm-hmm. plugging these gaps. You know, for example, multiverse theory or string theory, these sort of things. That, But strangely, they take on a certain reality. When we name things, 
for many people, casual observers, it then becomes that we've explained it because we've named it. Ah, yes, well, we didn't know what it was before. There was something there, but now we know what it is. It's dark matter and dark energy. Okay, great. We can move on to something else. But actually, it's just given it it a name. And I was, I remember in the early stages of the quest for the the Higgs boson at, um, at CERN, I, I remember talking to a quantum physicist. Um, it might have been Fred Allen Wolf, actually. I can't remember. One of those guys. And this is going back quite a few years, five or more. And I was saying, okay, this Higgs boson thing that, that, that we're looking for and that's, you know, has now been discovered or whatever. Is there something there? Is there something that we can pick up and turn over and look at the reverse of? And it's like, well, no, there isn't. Well, in what sense? In what sense is it real then, if you see what I mean? So I think there's a lot of that that goes on and, and it skews our popular understanding of science, of the, of the nature of reality is that there's these things that are out there that are suggested and then they then become real. And you can actually pile more stuff on top of these, even though that, that, that's the fundament is weak. You know, that the, the idea may be interesting. But it's, if you see what I mean, so it's a bit like, uh, your uh, analogy from the article about, about software, you know, you're putting layers upon layers without actually having a strong foundation for it. So I th- I would see a lot of that in science. And I, I read a lot of popular science because I want to know where the guy in the street is getting his information from. And for a lot of things, like quite early on in some of these books, I'm like, oh, hang on a minute. We haven't established this at all, but this is the basis for your <laughs> book. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, I, I, I like the way you express that. It's, that, that I, and I totally agree. I think things do take on a life of their own and then they're built upon and those are built upon and, you know, they're assumed to be accurate. And, and then along comes somebody like an Einstein who says, you know, the foundational aspect of this, what we think of as gravity, for example, isn't right. And that also takes a very uh, brave and insightful person to do. Uh, but when they do that, now, all of a sudden, all the stuff that was built on it kind of falls apart, and you have to build that back on to the, the new theory if the new theory is more more accurate. So all science is is, is trying to fit best theories to, to existing evidence, uh, and that will just never stop. And I, I, I love the scientific method because followed correctly – it's it's a great model for being able to you know fine tune things, but you can't take you can't remove yourself from the bigger picture like you said. Um, th- there's another kind of theory in in uh, in my my work uh, environment called uh, local optimization versus global optimization. Local optimization is where you try to optimize things in your little domain without seeing the bigger picture. And sometimes that's just the wrong thing to do. Um, and one of the examples given by a, uh, uh, a one of the systems thinkers, uh, Russ Eckhoff, is you take the best engine and the best transmission and the best components from different vehicles, you know, the best engine from a Rolls Royce, best transmission from a Mercedes or whatever, whatever the best of each thing is, each component from a vehicle, and you take them all together and you try to create a car, that car won't even run. So... You've locally optimized, but you haven't globally optimized. And I think that that metaphor there plays on the scientific level. You know, we're looking for a, a, a big theory of everything, but we have to be aware of all aspects that are going on and not keep on piling things onto um, existing theories just because those are the most accepted ones. Point was made recently in a, a book I was reading that uh, in terms of our trying to grasp the nature of reality and understand it, why we even think that we'd be able to do that. And that's it's an interesting question in itself, because for some people, we're kind of the cutting edge of, of evolution and we're driving the, the unfolding of um, of this reality. And uh, as unlikely as that seems sometimes when you look at the worst aspects of human existence, you kind of think that's pretty tawdry. Uh, why would we be the best of anything? But some people maintain that we, you know, as flawed as we are, this is it, you know, and there is no other life in the universe. We're it. Uh, let's go. But this point that, as I say, that I picked up uh, reading just recently was that, you know, our minds are not optimized to understand the nature of reality. They're optimized to survive in the, you know, African savanna or whatever and not get eaten by a lion. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's that plays to why we're uh, uncomfortable with change, because we're genetically engineered to be uncomfortable with change. If we 
if our ancestors, uh, you know, strayed out of the cave at night or, you know, challenged the saber toothed cat or whatever, they didn't pass on their genes. The ones that passed it, passed on their, their genes were the ones who played it safe and were afraid of, of trying different things, which is why we, people have such a challenge in today's world where they're told, uh, go out and be different, you know, differentiate our, our, our company, you know, you, you know, be, be creative. And it's hard because it, it, it feels forced. It, it goes against our nature. Well, you look at the indigenous peoples of the world, those that still survive, let's say like Native Americans, for example, Aboriginal Australians, you look at what challenges their society and it's being caught up in this whirlwind of development and growth and change, uh, constant change all around them that's, that came with the, you know, with the industrial and scientific revolutions in particular. It'd been ongoing for some time and you can look back to the, you know, the Greek and Roman empires, for example, and see echoes of how, you know, our modern civilizations go about, uh, business and life. But, the indigenous societies were characterized by this relatively static existence. Change was glacial, it came very slow pace, if any at all, and there was kind of a good reason for it. They were happy with that. Growth and development and all these other things were were kind of alien to them. And you could argue that that's really, that is, as you've basically hinted, that's our kind of our fundamental state. And there's this plays into something else that you talk about in the book, about pace of change, how that has been gathering. Yeah, absolutely. Um there are a lot of things that that you're reminding me of here. Why do we have to keep on building bigger things? Why do companies have to get bigger? Why do empires have to get bigger? And I think there's a, a backlash to that a little bit. You know, people are downsizing. They're uh, trying to live more simple lives. They're um, the the whole idea of the shared economy. You don't necessarily need to own a car. You can, you know, share a vehicle. You can share apartments. Whatever those kinds of things are. Um, I, I like that trend. To me, that feels like a, a, a good evolution of sort of the collective human consciousness because it's it's recognizing that it's not all about conquering things and being big and so forth. We're, we're definitely getting into a, a different area here, but um, yeah, the, the pace of change. It also leads to the idea that we're bad predictors of the future. You know, you and I are sitting here talking about what we think of reality, what we think reality might be like. And you mentioned before, you know, why should we even think that we can grasp the nature of reality? And you're right, we can't. Um, but it does give us some satisfaction to grasp, grasp it enough, uh, you know, for the foreseeable future to be able to, you know, feel kind of comfortable with the strange things that go on the world in the world. And I, I think, you know, I think that's where, where my book comes in. It's not saying that this is the be all and end all and that 200 years from now or 10,000 years from now, um, that will explain everything. But for the foreseeable future, it does a lot to explain the things that puzzle us today. And that gives, uh, it gives me, it gives a lot of people a certain level of satisfaction. In in fact, if you kind of dig into the philosophy, it's it's a bit wrapped up in the idea that uh, we're not a product of our brains. You know, our consciousness is not just something that um, has emerged from the complexity of our brain. That no, our mind is actually somewhere else. Uh, there is a sea of consciousness out there that that you're part of and I'm I'm part of, and it syncs with what the ancients and the indigenous cultures around the world have always said we're part of a whole, we're part of God or whatever, um, and that we uh, reincarnate and that we we learn as we do. And, and that syncs very well with this theory, and it matches what we've kind of believed from, you know, ancient times as well. So it's explaining quantum mechanics, and it's, and it's explaining why those who had religious experiences or spiritual experiences came to similar conclusions. And that's pretty remarkable that something can address that range of, uh, of ideas. Yeah. And in, in your book, when you're talking about interconnectedness and different dimensions of it, pardon the pun, but you know, things like past lives that people feel they've experienced or phenomena like synchronicity and it, into all the things that are being revealed to us in quantum physics, um, near death experiences, you name it, all suddenly start to come into some kind of, yeah, you know, some kind of light bulb moment around those things. 
with, you know, as possible and explainable and in fact natural and inevitable in a way when you zoom out and look at things in a bigger picture, a wider, a more detailed background along the lines that you're espousing. Yeah, definitely. There, there, and it brings us back to a little bit of what we were talking about earlier. There are a, a number of theories that explain, as I mentioned, some of the quantum mechanics anomalies. And one by one, those hidden variable theories have been disproven. Uh, one experiment after another has just shown, okay, that that sort of the idea that there's an objective material, materialistic reality out there, and we're experience it, experiencing it in a subjective way, but it's fixed, and it's, and it follows rules. That idea keeps falling um, apart based on the evidence from various uh, uh, various experiments. Uh, but there was one guy, and I think it might have been um, John Bell, if I got the name right, who who came up with a theory of super determinism, the idea that even these things that we see as a result of quantum mechanics experiments, when when an observer uh, appears to um, impact the result of the experiment, that that was predetermined. You know, even that kind of thing was predetermined. So we're living this one big, you know, maybe digital, uh, you know, uh, flow of, of experiences, but we have no control over it. We have no free will. There's this uh, super deterministic idea that, that everything, and the, the odd thing about it is that if that were true, what it's saying is that the very nature of what we're experiencing is the complete opposite of what is really underlying it, which is, to me, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So I, I don't think super determinism is a good answer for things, and it's also a kind of a hopeless answer, basically saying you have no free will, there's nothing you can do, and it's all predetermined. Yeah, exactly, because if you then feel that you have free will, which most of us do, uh, if, if you then, that's why, as you say, it can't make any sense, the idea. How would you grasp the idea that you don't have it if you apparently do? Because to what extent then is the exactly. idea that you, you don't have it, does it mean anything? Because if you feel that you're making decisions that you can suddenly change course and that if you decide to challenge yourself and say you're in the store buying some groceries and you happen to be mulling over the idea of whether we have free will or not and you said, oh yeah, well, we didn't, or, you know, we're having chicken for dinner or whatever. You say, oh no, hang on a minute. We're not. <laughs> you know, we're going to have whatever noodles, you know, and uh, you then say, well, yeah, that, I hadn't thought about that earlier, but I've changed something. But then, you know, it's that whole point, again, getting back to matrix like idea. Of what would that actually look like in, in real life? I mean, it would it become becomes meaningless. And there's all sorts of things actually that get put out there as um, constructs to, to hang theories of reality on that are that actually you, you can't prove one way or another. It's kind of like, OK, well, that's conceivable. But how would we know? Yeah, so super determinism is one of those. Solipsism is another one of those. And, mm. you know, while, you know, I, I would have to acknowledge that those are things that could exist. Those are things that could explain everything that we see. Um, if they are, there's really no point in us even having this conversation. There's no point in my book. There's no point in, in life. And I just have to believe that there's, there's uh, something more to it than that because otherwise, you know, I'd, why get up to work in the morning, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So it's something you hinted at a moment ago, I think is quite important. The idea, uh, you know, Einstein, as you say, came along to challenge this, that the idea that physical laws um, are immutable, even those which we've not yet discovered, apparently, or you know, even the ones that change are immutable. You see what I mean? That's kind of the sort mm -hmm. of the word, form of words we'd probably come up with. I think that some of the, I've read some interesting material about variation in so-called cosmological constants, even things like the aforementioned speed of light, that these things that ground apparently reality might be subject to variation. And I think it's, hasn't there been, hasn't someone done work on variations in gravity, how that has changed slightly over time and that but these things are sometimes factored in by scientists into their observations and calculations but it's kind of swept under the rug a little bit they don't talk about it oh we had to adjust our computer program because you know this has slightly changed over the last million years or whatever and the idea that you know if a small change is possible well what does that open the door to yeah that that's an interesting one uh i have read a little bit about that about the idea of some cosmological constants uh changing and the evidence for it again it's one of those things like dark matter it's a way to explain what we're observing 
and uh, you know, and, and maybe it's a good explanation, but it kind of leads you to th- to question, you know, the the hardness of of reality, which maybe gets to kind of our our main point here. You know, what what do we think this this really is? What's really going on? Um, and you know, my guess is that there is a you know a huge digital system, and we're we're part of that. And I, that digital system sounds very uh, you know, 2018, uh, words like digital, it sounds almost like, well, you're only saying that because, uh, because that's the age that we live in. Um, uh, yeah, maybe, but there's, there's a fundamental question about whether reality is discrete or continuous, whether there's an infinity out there or not. Those are sort of fundamental things that will, will never go away. And I think that, so if, if we, Look at the evidence. Uh, it, it seems to be indicating that deep down there is some uh, discrete and uh, uh, digital nature to reality, and that we're living in this big system that, um, y- you know, that is is constantly evolving. And what we are is part of it. Like our our souls, our minds are part of that system, and w- you know we do uh, play out a sort of a simulation in this what we we apparently call a physical reality. It's really very virtual, but we're, we're in it and we learn from it and we evolve our values and we evolve our consciousness from this each time we, we play this out. Well, that whole virtual simulation that I'm talking about is just a big piece of the bigger system. And it's a piece that, you know, we call the, like the reality learning lab. Um, Tom Campbell and I have both used that term. Um, but it's a piece that, pertains to everything it per- pertains to our brains it pertains to the universe that we see uh, you know when we look out in, in telescopes so it's everything that we can observe is just that one portion of the bigger system so as the system evolves it may it may find that it needs to modify or there may be a reason why cosmological constants change over time or uh, dark matter suddenly appears or whatever. It's almost like a patch to a program. You know, as the system evolves, it, it needs to adjust according to what? According to the, you know, the sum total of all the consciousnesses out there and what they need to continual, uh, continually evolve their consciousness. Yeah, I think there's a strong sense reflected in everything from the aforementioned ancient wisdom traditions through to cutting edge science that the reality that we're experiencing, that the one that you are in, are in right now, apparently talking to each other, isn't fundamental. And we have the strong sense of that coming from somewhere or something to here for a while and then going back to something right. or somewhere else, if you see what I mean. And that, that's captured and it forms part of so many different uh, worldviews. Yeah, and you wonder why. Why so many different worldviews that that came from different cultures around the globe that, that seem to evolve separately? I mean, one argument could be that there was some, you know, fundamental source of that idea and it spread throughout the world. But I don't know if that's necessarily the case. Um, it, what it, it seems to be is that there is a an experience that some people have where they transcend this you know quote physical reality that we're in and they experience the different thing that you're talking about um they may do it uh in in a you know because of ritualistic drumming or while they're asleep or you know just have an aha moment or sit under under a tree uh you know um who was it uh uh, Muhammad, uh, uh, the Buddha, uh, you know, figures throughout history have had these experiences and they're all, there's a lot of commonality to them. So what could account for that commonality in different cultures is maybe that those experiences are, are part of the same truth, you know, that they are experiencing something that is more fundamental than, uh, than our apparent physical reality here. Just a little aside, uh, while I remember echoing something you said in your comments about last Thursdayism, it was mentioned to me, I remember a while ago I was having a conversation and someone was saying about after you'd lived for a certain amount of time that the quite distant portions of your life take on a sort of a dreamlike quality. And I thought about that and I thought even 20 years ago, I th- thought about the main people, places and events in my life. I found the quality had sort of changed over time. I can't really explain it, but 
this person's comment about a dreamlike quality, I could see what they meant. It it's felt like something I couldn't really touch anymore. It, it, it taken on a sort of an unreal quality. And I was reminded uh, how we remember things differently. Mm-hmm. Um, even after quite a short passage of time, some will say like, uh, you know, we, yeah, we were at the bar last week and, uh, you know, Jim showed up and he was wearing that, uh, he was wearing that green shirt that he likes, uh, you know, but I, I can't stand it, blah, blah, blah. And he said, no, he wasn't. Jim wasn't wearing a green shirt. You know what I mean? And people kind of very fixed ideas about what they've experienced that, that are in conflict with each other. Yeah, it reminds me of the the quote from one of the Star Wars movies where Yoda says, always cloudy the future is, or maybe always cloudy the past is, too. Um, you know, it, it also brings to mind, uh, you're probably familiar with the, the Mandela effect, mm-hmm. right? And And so, you know, there are some examples of things where there are, you know, different groups of people who are fundamentally at odds with history, with what happened in the past. And it's a little hard to explain that as a mass delusion in all of the cases. You know, half the population is has a mass delusion about this, you know, and, and the other half doesn't. Oh, and oh, in this other case, it's a different segment of the population that has a mass delusion about it, and, and the others don't. Well, maybe what, what's really going on is that the, the past does change. Maybe it's a little bit softer than, than we think it is. Uh, and it would certainly be something that could easily be done in this this philosophy that I'm talking about, you know, I, again, I, I try to not to use the word simulation, but it's a convenient one. If you're in a simulation or you're, you're playing out some sort of programmatic, uh, you know, digital uh, system like this, then it's not hard to go back and change all the artifacts. So the Mandela effect is, is one where the system for some reason has decided to go back and change the artifacts or maybe it's changed, you know, one artifact is people's memory. Maybe it's changed that. Uh, for some people, why? Not so sure. Uh, it, it, that's kind of hard to speculate about, but um, there's certainly a logical explanation for it in the digital con- consciousness kind of philosophy. Well, you mentioned uh, Elon Musk earlier, and I know that the ideas in your book have a lot of relevance when we're thinking about the issues of artificial intelligence or nanotech or whatever it happens to be. Some of the developments coming down the line that the likes of Musk and earlier uh, Ray Kurzweil and his ilk would have talked about the forthcoming singularity and ideas around transhumanism and what have you. And I've done a lot of shows based around those ideas, basically being concerned about where these things might be headed. But I know that you've spoken about this in some detail and you feel perhaps that the technological development that everyone's assuming is accelerating, uh, that that may actually be slowing down and also that in a lot of the big ideas around uh, the singularity and transhumanism and, and AI and what may be possible in the future that there are some fundamental misunderstandings that people may have in their minds about this um, that there may be some limitations that these things may not pan out just as the advocates um, are claiming yeah I'm, I'm a little disturbed about a lot of that um, I mean just for a couple of reasons, we'll, we'll talk about a couple of things. Um, on the singularity front, like like we've t- talked about in this show, uh, I, I do think that we've basically taken a concept like Moore's Law and then used that to extrapolate when we're going to merge with AI and have this uh, sort of uh, exponentially increasing um, singularity. And I think the, the flaw in that is is just that uh, AI is a lot more complex than we thought it was. Uh, I mean, people were talking about 20 years ago that by now we should have robots uh, doing everything and um, that, that we would have a general AI. And what we have is very specific AIs that can beat go masters and chess masters and work on an assembly line and things like that. But we do not have a general AI that can think and evolve the way a human does. Not that that's not possible. But I just I think that it's a way more complex thing. And I think the history of the changes in or the advances in artificial intelligence uh, are slow enough that the, the sort of 2045 date for the singularity to occur, uh, I, I don't necessarily believe in it. So that's that's one aspect on the transhumanism side. Um, it is a related concept, but the idea that people 
will live long enough to live forever that we can, you know, upload our consciousness into silicon and things like that. Um, I, I think the, the premise behind wanting that is flawed because I think we're already immortal. I think that we already reincarnate. I, and I believe the evidence for that is strong, uh, that we, we live these lives over and over to learn and to evolve. So we don't need to extend our physical life necessarily. We, we just need to do what we've been doing. And, and so I think fear of dying is, and, and fear of dying in a materialistic world is driving that transhumanism movement. And I think that's, that's a flawed, uh, fundamental concept. Yeah. Yeah, I think so too. I wholeheartedly agree actually with everything you've just said. That's my current feeling about it anyway. Always leaving that open that, that might change. I uh, have to be consistent here, you know, be consistent in being prepared to change. Uh, yes. <laughs> I think we're way too concerned with the survival of the, the body uh, and the idea of like, an individual mind that somehow goes away when the body dies. Um, I have had a, taken part in a past life regression hypnosis session. And that was interesting for me. I did it um, not because I had any personal hankering to do it or any feelings that there was something I needed to discover. It was purely out of interest. I received a really, really powerful just gestalt download of previous one one life in particular. And it was all there complete in crazy amounts of detail that I was able to speak about during this session, but that I couldn't have made up on the fly. It, I, I would have had to have thought too fast too quickly like someone said to you just improvise a, a life for yourself just forget the person you are and what you've done just come up with something different and tell us a different life story you'd, you'd struggle i'll tell you if you start to then mm -hmm. try and put intimate details on it like you know details of your your spouse and your children and exact details about the mundane aspects of your everyday life but i was able to do that and i didn't feel that that certainly if none of it was actually ever physically real then it was still coming to me from somewhere else because i did not think of that life and those people, places and events, mm -hmm. just, as I was lying on the on the, the the couch, I just didn't come up with it then. It was already presented in front of me. Yeah, exactly. And and think about that that boy. I'm sure you know uh, this uh, this case of a little boy at three years old. He remembered a past life as a fighter pilot in World War II and started naming all of his uh, colleagues, his fellow pilots, and named the aircraft carrier they were on and where the plane crashed and all of this kind of stuff. And had not had not read anything. His parents hadn't talk to him about that. Hey, I didn't watch a show about this, uh, or anything. And, you know, come to find out all of what he brought up was, was accurate. And he even went to visit the, uh, relatives of his, uh, reincarnated, you know, previous in incarnation, uh, individual. So, you know, for, for you to have that kind of, uh, aha moment or download of a past life, could be certainly it could be significant. I've, I've had two myself. I'm a little bit less uh, convinced there was anything significant to them. And I think one of the challenges that I've had personally is, as much as I like to feel like I'm open minded, I think there there still subconsciously is something to me that that makes it hard for exploring these things. Uh, I've done a lot of meditation, and I found that when I was really good in my meditation practice that it was opening up and that I was starting to experience other things. I had an out of, a couple out-of-body experiences when I was meditating a, a lot, and they were really, really cool. Um, but, it, you know, again, it added added more fuel to the fire for me, you know, that, that there is more out there than this uh, uh, physical reality. A couple little points in sort of a tidying up exercise. The word simulation that we've used and gets used here kind of – for me anyway, it implies a, a copy of something that somehow already exists or previously existed. Also, of course, there's the idea that if we were in a, a perfect simulation, you know, how would we ever know that? And I, I wonder why we would be having these thoughts, if you see what I mean, why we'd be questioning it, you know, where the impulse that I spoke about earlier of, of thinking there was something fundamentally wrong with the world, or if not wrong, then at least unexplained where that would come from as well. And then I started to think, well, maybe is that a deliberate thing? Mm -hmm. are, are we are, are we actually meant to question this? Are we meant to get to a point where we is that part of the plan that we start to ask these questions? Yeah, I kind of think that the system, which I'm going to call like the bigger the bigger digital system that the the quote simulation this real life simulation is in, if you will, um, that that 
that that system is a little agnostic about that, that it's all there. We, we can question it all we want, but the system will respond. And if we're questioning to the point where we're changing in a negative way the evolution of the system, I wouldn't be surprised to see the system step in and do something to update itself you know, in a different direction so that it, it's, it's constantly evolving in the right direction. I don't know if that makes a whole lot of sense, it, it, but, you know, as an example, um, you know, this is another reason why I question the singularity. I feel like, you know, if this theory is accurate, there's probably not going to be some catastrophic event that wipes out all of consciousness or fundamentally changes all of consciousness because then the whole purpose of the, the, the system seems to fail. So, you know, I, I, I talk about an evening effect in, in the Universe Solved book uh, where we, you know, we often think that there's this uh, inexorable march toward a disaster that we can ne never return from. For example, uh, nuclear war back in the 60s, uh, it was inevitable. You know, everybody was practicing, you know, building bomb shelters and practicing getting under their desks and, and all that kind of thing because we, we knew that was going to happen. Well, it didn't. Um, and even the rogue states haven't used them yet. Uh, then in the, in the 70s, there was the um, inexorable overpopulation of the world. The, you know, you look at the charts and there was no doubt that our world wouldn't be able to feed itself in 20 years. And, well, you know, that didn't happen either. And I'm not minimizing the danger of some of these things like uh, uh, nanotech or, or, you know, DNA splicing or singularity. Um, certainly there are things that we should be thinking about and, and be concerned about, but I, but I feel like the system prevents them from being catastrophic somehow. And that it always just kind of evens out a little bit to keep us, you know, moving in a certain direction. Well, that certainly seems to be the case, and I think that would that puts a lot of uh, doom saying at around these days into some sort of perspective, doesn't it? Really, because even though yes. there's been a apocalyptic uh, thought has been there as far back in human history as we can reach, that, uh, that but at the moment it feels kind of like on steroids, really, and you don't have to look very far to see, um, you know, to read articles and hear people talking about and just even the general feeling in society that we're kind of like we're on a dark path and that things are only getting worse. Uh, you know, despite some evidence to the contrary, I think for me anyway, there's lots of different ways I can look at phases in my life, but certainly one pre-9-11 and post-9-11, I can talk about some meaningful changes there. If you see what I mean, it seemed to be like almost a shift in consciousness. And for a lot of people, that was like an unparalleled event, which has spun out and tripped off and caused so many, you know, knock on effects and so many other feedback loops. Um, a lot of which are, uh, interrelated, which bring us to the point where we find ourselves now. And certainly the election of Trump, for example, from, for a lot of people seems to be just, you know, one more, piece of evidence that we're doomed but but is it also conceivable that there there have been catastrophic events in the past history of this big experiment or a big machine whatever it happens to be and that they just go okay two point not whatever it is we're back we'll start again uh certainly yeah if, one, one reading yeah. of the one reading of the bible is in fact that there was creation and there was existence at one point and it was, at some point it was seen to be like not satisfactory anymore so it was wiped out and started again yeah, it's kind of like the architect in the Matrix, you know, where they, mm. they had things too perfect for a while. So they had to, and, you know, I, I think these ideas are spot on. You know, I, I, I think it, it could have reset. And yes, we, we could reset. But the fact that, uh, let's just take one small example. You probably read about this, uh, and I don't know his name, but there was a, a Russian, um, military guy who prevented, uh, Armageddon. And, and there was this this yes. case where their their systems went haywire, and they reported incoming missiles from the United States, and they were about to push the button, and he said no. Um, and and so you look at that and you say, wow, what if he hadn't said no? What if he was just like everybody else who was eager to to push the button? Or what if um, you know what if what he wasn't there? What if it was somebody else who was in the the chain of command, uh, et cetera, et cetera? And it seems like such a fragile thing that we were on the brink of, you know, civilization being destroyed. But maybe what happened was his greater consciousness 
said to him, gave him the hint, hey, don't do this because it's not right. And he had one of those moments of, you know, a fundamental belief that prevented him from doing that. So maybe the system or us, you know, outside of the system, we are able to kind of control things a little bit and, and prevent them from going haywire. Well, do you know what? I had a conversation with a friend recently and uh, it was in the wake of some terrorist incident or other, one of those tawdry and somehow mundane incidents, but that still has a devastating impact on those directly involved. You know, like someone crashing a vehicle into a crowd or running around in a public place with a knife or something stabbing people. It's horrible, but in the, in the universal scheme, it just seems so pathetic. And uh, we're basically asking ourselves why there wasn't more of that happening, because to listen to some commentators and to listen to some thoughts about this, you would think that this is widespread, it's everywhere, it's getting worse. And we thought, well, there aren't people, it was so, such an easy thing to do, mm -hmm. if you see what I mean, to cause that sort of disruption. Why aren't people phoning in bomb scares into like public buildings and you know stores or theatres or whatever every single day all over the place? Why isn't there people, everyone's got knives in their kitchen, why aren't dozens, you know, hundreds of people going out every day um, stabbing other people. They're, they're not doing it for a reason, but it must be very, very easy to do. So I think there's just, uh, there's perception and then there's actual events on the ground. And I think even the fact that there isn't as, as chaotic as the world is and as many negative events unfold on a daily basis, it's, it could be on so, an order of magnitude so much greater that that would be entirely feasible, possible. And we should say likely, given some of the uh, thoughts about where we are and where we're going, but yet it's not happening. It's not actually like that. Yeah, uh, that's a, another good example of how our greater consciousness may be uh, interfering. It's that that voice inside you that says, "No, this isn't the right thing to do," and it really takes somebody going over the edge and just being completely out of touch to not listen to that. And that could be coming from, uh, you know. From, from another place, you know, not from the, our cash in our brain that that is processing the stuff that's going on in reality. But no, it's coming from, you know, our, our fundamental fundamental being, which is somewhere else. OK, Jim, well, just a couple of closing thoughts before we wrap it up for today. One question that always was the first uh, at the forefront of my mind when considering your general thesis, for example, about the nature of reality is why What's this for? And I also thought, you know, is a purpose even necessary? You know, there might be some grand scheme here, grand design, but could it just be like because it can be done? It's like whatever that there isn't actually, uh, uh, there isn't actually any teleology. There's no goal in mind. Yeah, it could be. Um, I know uh, Tom Campbell's point of view is that it's, uh, it, it's, 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 at some point you have to kind of um, believe something, I think. And, you know, what, what he believes is that. Fundamentally, there's a, uh, a a law of continuous improvement or a law of evolution that says that, you know, the system, the bigger system is always going to evolve to a higher state, to a state where it's a higher level of consciousness, whatever, whatever that means. So, so that's what drives it. Is, is there going to be evil in the world? Of course there is, because we have free will, so we can do these things. Um, but we should be learning over time. Um, and if you kind of step back and look at the bigger picture and you look at, say, I don't know, murder rates over the past 500 years have drastically dropped. And, you know, the, the, the abuse of animals has, has dropped significantly. And it's not those problems haven't been solved for sure. But we do seem to be as a species and as a as a, you know, all conscious beings somewhat evolving, you know, in in what feels like the right direction. So that, that could be just due to this fundamental law of the bigger system wanting to constantly improve itself. Um, but I could, I could allow that, you know, maybe, maybe there is no continuous improvement mechanism and the system's just out there, uh, responding as it does, but it wouldn't explain, that wouldn't explain why we do seem to be continually improving in, in certain areas. So, as mentioned, it's been a decade since you originally published the book. Just, I mean, in closing, what what thing has changed? Uh, what has developed? Is there anything that you have, you're, you've modified your ideas about? Anything that's um, happened sooner than you would have expected, or to a greater extent? Is there anything that hasn't happened that you might have expected to happen? 
Well, I think having the number of people that have kind of uh, accepted or started to talk about this was uh, was a little surprising, but I, I think it's a good thing. Um, the the when I wrote the first book, I was pretty agnostic about the whys behind it, and you know, really what was uh, sort of driving this. Uh, this system. It just, you know, the first book was mostly a collection of evidence as opposed to, you know, diving a little bit deeper and, and saying, you know, is, is this a simulation that, that some entity created? Um, is it us in the future? Is it something else entirely? Uh, was it created by a god, you know, or whatever? I was pretty agnostic to that, but I have definitely evolved my thinking over the years that um, that it is more like uh, a continuous improvement system and that what people might call God is all that there is. Uh, you know, it's certainly not in the sense that we think of the word God as a kind of, you know, personification of a human, uh, a perfect personification of the human or something like that, but no more as the, you know, ev everything that there is and that we are part of all of that. Our consciousness is so definitely evolved the, my thinking along those lines and collected a lot more evidence over the last 10 years supporting those ideas uh, both the idea that it's consciousness driven and the idea that the uh, world is digital okay Jim. well today we've been talking about your book the universe solved a new provocative view of the true nature of reality. Now, I know that you've got a, the one I've got is a hardback original edition. You've got a paperback one finally available because that book's been out of print for some time. You mentioned a new book more than once. Is that you're talking about the new edition of The Universe Solved or have you got something brand new coming out as well? No, it's brand new um, and it's called uh, Digital Consciousness. Um, it's in production now. There uh, have been some delays on cover art and things like that, but um, should be coming out uh, within a few months. And that 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 basically kind of catches us up to where we are. So um, it explores a lot more anomalies, it explores in much more detail uh, the nature of quantum mechanics and what could explain all of it. it. It talks about the Mandela effect, and it has the big picture of these sort of you know, this abductive reasoning that I talked about before, like Venn diagrams of, you know, here's a theory of everything that explains everything. And here's why it should be considered, because none of these other theories explain this or that or, or these these other anomalies. So I, I put together a very kind of logical and scientific, I don't want to say proof, but, you know, hypothesis of, um, you know, strong evidence for, for this for, for this theory. Okay, so folks can look out for the new book soon. And in the meantime, Universe Solved is back in print. Perhaps you'd like to share our details of a website or anything else you'd like to put out there. Oh, sure. Thanks, Greg. Um, TheUniverseSolved.com is a website that has uh, my blog on it. Um, and there's a forum that uh, hasn't been used too much. Uh, but that, that's kind of a, a, a place to go, sort of a portal for some of these ideas um, in the book. Uh, it's called The Universe Solved. It can be bought on Amazon, um, most places around the world. And uh, it's available in Kindle form, paperback, and uh, the, like I said, the hardcover is now out of print, but I, I think there are some used ones that are floating around. And the new book will be coming out um, in uh, various online uh, uh, outlets as well. Splendid. Well, Jim, once again, thanks so much for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. Thank you very much, Greg. Very much enjoyed our talk. Uh, it was very stimulating, and, and uh, you're a great interviewer. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you.